Zoe, maybe you want to kick off and tell us a little bit more about you. Sure. So uh, my name is Zoe Williams. I am born and raised in Inglewood, Colorado. Um, my parents, my dad's a contractor and my mom is a postal worker. I'm sorry. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, you're fine. Uh, yeah, my pronouns are they and them. So you'd say they and them instead of she or her or he or him. Um, so uh, I grew up in Inglewood, Colorado to a contractor and a postal worker um, living blocks away from the house that my dad was raised in and that my grandfather was raised in a very small uh, white working class suburb called Inglewood, just south of Denver. So um, Inglewood is, I think, a really good town to look at when we think about what's happening a lot in our country. Um, because especially after the last election, we heard a lot about the white working class, which actually people are talking not about the white working class. They're talking about people without college degrees, which is not the same as being white working class. But we look at Inglewood, it's a community that has a lot of white folks that have not had these and a lot of folks of color, and they were pushed there um, and forced to live there as more affluent people wanted to live in Denver. And as there was less affordable housing in Denver, um, and as people needed, like my grandmother's family came out because they were farmers and needed jobs and couldn't find jobs in Nebraska, and so they ended up in Inglewood and were living in people's sheds and finally were able to build their own house. Um, and in Inglewood, we see a community, especially the white working class folks that are still there, the people that I grew up with, the people that I went to school with, are really angry because they can't get a job that will pay their bills. They can't send their kids to school. Um, I know folks right now that are deciding, do I be homeless? Or do I move to Grand Junction, where I have no community and no network, because I can't afford to live in the city that my family has lived in for three and four generations. Um, the best, the biggest employer in England right now is Walmart, and we know how folks are treated in those workplaces. Um, but also because I see, I, I've noticed that folks aren't talking to my community though when they talk about oppression and issues like that, especially when we when we see like the way that the Democratic Party has commodified anti-oppression agendas and how nonprofits have taken on anti-racism, anti-sexism. Nobody's talking to the people I went to school with. They're talking to folks with, that are in colleges, that are in universities. They're talking to people that have a lot of opportunity. But the people who are talking to the folks that I went to school with are the police, the military, um, and the and so if you talk to folks that I grew up with, they will tell you that their immigrant neighbor is more of a threat to them than Donald Trump. And this is why, so this is what brings me to do this work. Because I grew up thinking that the best approach to doing organizing, um, when I first started to take this on, I was sort of born with a, a lens for justice. I mean, there's some people that I saw in this room that I've known since I was 13 years old. I started trying to do organizing and activism and have this idea that we're all in this together and we don't need to talk about our differences. We just need to talk about what brings us together and try and move forward together. And that's, that doesn't work. And that actually makes it so folks who come from a background like me get swept up into that Trump machine. Um, and it's what makes it so that there are these divides that make it so that we can't come together and take down the things that we need to take down. That make it so that we aren't talking about guaranteed basic wages for everybody. That we aren't talking about universal health care. Instead, we're debating over these little things. We're fighting over scraps in our communities. We're fighting over who gets the job at Walmart and Inglewood. Instead of why are there people with millions and millions and millions of dollars and we can't even buy pencils for our school. And so I became an anti-oppression trainer not to talk about privilege to college folks, but to bring folks in social justice movements together and to take on some of these hard issues that can be painful, that can be vulnerable, that can be embarrassing, that can be really challenging, but ultimately make our work impactful and make it so that we can win some of these big fights together. So it's a little bit about what I do, what I do. Um, I have been doing this work for almost 20 years in Denver. I've been an anti-oppression facilitator for about 10 years now. Um, and we're going to talk about a few different things. We're going to talk about um, what is oppression and, and how, how do we define it so that we have shared language to talk about it. 
We're going to talk about the different places that oppression lives in our world, which can help us think about how do we dismantle it. Um, and we're also going to talk about what's the role of folks. Um, so like I said, I grew up in a white working class town. What's my role as a white person in fighting racism? Because I have a role, but it's going to be different than folks of color. Um, it's going to be different than middle class white people. So thinking about what what is our stake, what is our strength, and what can we bring? Um, and I have a hard stop at three. It's actually my best friend's baby shower today that I'm the host of. And I moved it back because when a revolutionary woman of color asks me to do an anti-oppression workshop, I say yes. <laughs> because the leadership of women of color is a gift for me. So, um, so yeah, I have to go host a baby shower after this. Um, but I will hard to stop at three, but Andrew and Natalia are going to hold a meeting to other folks in this room. So if you have questions or things that are sticking with you and you want to talk through them more, I am available afterwards, just not here afterwards. Um, you can get you my phone number. <coughs> Does that sound good? Awesome. So I think one of the most important things is when we're talking about oppression, what we're talking about is power. So what does the word power mean to folks in this room? Money. What else? Influence. 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 What else? Control. Access. Control. Access. Control. Access. Yeah. So power is the ability to control circumstances. Uh, it's the ability to have resources and decide who does and does not get resources. And power is sort of the, the cornerstone of what we're talking about when we're talking about oppression. Um, another important piece of when we talk about oppression is the word prejudice. What does the word prejudice mean to folks? Judging people based on uh, just judging people based on just a group, uh, usually like a racial, sexual, or uh, or disability, <laughs> or any other <coughs> any other group that they may be a part of, just based on preconceived stereotypes of that group instead of just judging them on their personality and who they are as a person. Yeah. Yes. And also his way of thinking. Yes. You know, people are prejudiced if you are not thinking just like them and if they cannot oppress you then you're out. Yep. Out of that point. So <laughs> that's our oppression too. Okay. So I, I'm just going to say real quick that I, I pushed my friend's baby shower back to come here and do an anti-oppression training. I understand there's some intense stuff going on and people have some big feelings, but also like these issues are issues that, like, first of all, it's why I'm here, and I'm not going to get into, you know, how everyone's feeling about the Green Party. Um, I'm actually going to shut that down because that's not what I'm here for, and that's not respectful of my kind of expertise. Um, and it also doesn't honor the very real fact that there, there's the biggest Nazi rally that's happened in our time going on right now in Virginia. Yeah. Like, and and there, there is huge things happening that also deserve our attention. And so, so I understand that people are holding a lot in this room, but right now is our time to talk about oppression. And then I'm going to leave and y'all can talk about the Green Party. <laughs> but right now, like, let's talk about the fight that we have in front of us. The big, the big huge fight that we have to, we have to win. I'm a parent of two kids that I left, and I was thinking as I was leaving, two little white children, an almost year old, an almost four-year-old, and thinking about who's going to win my kids' hearts. Is it going to be the alt-right? Is it going to be white supremacy? Is it going to be capitalism? Is it going to be the forces that want to destroy our planet? Is it going to be patriarchy? Is it going to be Islamophobia? Or is it going to be justice? And that's, to me, the state for this. Is it the fight for my children's hearts? my children's future. And I think if everyone can think about what's their stake in this, what's their thing that drives them to do this work on a Saturday afternoon and, and try and shake off some of the other things that we're processing right now, I think that would be a big gift to, to yourselves and to this movement and to this moment. Um, so we talked about power. We talked about prejudice. So oppression is what happens when you take power and prejudice and put it together. So there's, there are prejudices out there. There are people with many different kinds of prejudices. 
I might have a prejudice that I say people that don't have tattoos aren't cool. <laughs> uh, and that could be my prejudice. There are also people who might say uh, people that don't have blue hair aren't cool. But do I have the ability to enforce that people that don't have tattoos or don't have blue hair can't access food or housing or water or clothing or education? No. Why? Because I don't have power behind my prejudice. So this is where the no reverse racism, no reverse sexism happens. There is prejudice, absolutely. People have, and, and the prejudice comes from many different places. Oftentimes it comes from lived experiences of violence and trauma. Um, I know I am a rape survivor. I have had a lot of very challenging experiences with white men. And sometimes I say, I don't like men. I don't want them around me. And that's prejudice. But I'm not going to be able to go around and say, men are going to earn 75 cents on my dollar. Men are going to fear for their lives every time they walk down the street. Men are going to face discrimination in the workplace. So I might have a prejudice. And it comes from pain but I don't have the power behind it. And it's the same with race. There's no reverse racism, no reverse sexism, no reverse homophobia. So we're reverse anything goes out the door today. Uh, so say goodbye to reverse racism. <laughs> goodbye. <laughs> we aren't using those words anymore. Was it ever here to begin with? Wait, yes. Yes. I mean, it's a, it's a social, it's, it's something that we've made up, that many of us have introduced into our vocabularies. We've heard about it from different places. We censor ourselves because we've been worried. Am I being reversed this? Am I being reversed that? And they send us goodbye, out the door, moving up. So we're talking about oppression, which is power, plus prejudice. Another important thing to think about when we talk about oppression is that the, the, another crux of it is that when someone's being kept down, other people get unearned benefits. Mm. Unearned benefits. So I didn't wake up and say, I'm going to get white privilege. I'm going to, I want that. And I choose that. I was born white in a world that values white lives more than the lives of people of color. I was born into a white supremacist world. I have white privilege. Even, even the days that I didn't know where my food was going to come from, whether I was going to be sleeping on a car or park bench, I had white privilege. And no amount of other challenges I've had in my life have ever erased that. And that's, that, that's hard to hold sometimes. There have been times where I've wanted to say, here, take this, so I'm going to go over here. Or been like, I have more people of color around me than white people. Or my life looks more like my friends of color than than white people, and that doesn't do anything for anyone. That doesn't help me break down the reality that I was born into. That doesn't undo white supremacy or racism. It actually just confuses things and blurs things. And so it can be hard to say I have privilege in these spaces, especially in social justice world. Sometimes there's like badge, like, like, oh, I identify as non-binary femme, I have a disability, and I grew up working class. So I have my I, oppressed identity badges, and so don't call me privileged. Um, and that can, there can be a drive to shy away from that. But instead, I just ask that when we talk about this, if you find a place where you have privilege, own it. Because your privilege is also your tool. So as a white person, I get access to places that some of my friends of color with radical politics and blue hair and tattoos don't get into. So I get invited to do workshops for the Colorado Department of Public Health and Environment on anti-oppression. And I go in there and make all the white doctors very uncomfortable, telling them all kinds of things. <laughs> and, and part of that is because I, you own, like, I have privilege, I have access, I can do this. And it doesn't mean that I, that, you know, it, that's a, that is a tool for our movement. So the question that we all need to shift our minds to, and it's a hard one, and it's one that I often still struggle with, is less of how can I get out of being called privileged, and how can I turn my privilege into a weapon 
against the system of violence. Applause, son. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> How can I turn my privilege into a weapon against the system of violence? And I should say that that somewhat is derived from the brilliance of Loretta Ross, a woman of color, because so much brilliance comes from women of color and their labor needs to be honored and appreciated. Loretta Ross said, we need to weaponize our privilege and not our consciousness, meaning that folks on the left need to spend less time running around saying, you didn't say that exactly right, this isn't good enough, here's how I'm better than you, and instead make sure that we're using the privilege that we have to fight racism, to fight sexism, to fight homophobia, and fight capitalism. So I have to say that that, that would not exist without the rhetoric. All right. You all riding with me still? Yeah. yeah. All right. So we've talked about power. We've talked about prejudice. We've talked about oppression. And we've talked about privilege. So when we talk about oppression, I like to use a tool called the four eyes of oppression. Normally I draw a really pretty drawing up here, but there's not a whiteboard. So <laughs> I'm going to ask you all to imagine these things. So the first eye of oppression is ideological. And again, when we think about the four eyes of oppression, I think of these as like the four homes of oppression, the places that oppression lives in our lives, um, in the world around us. And in order to take it out in any of these one places, we have to address the whole thing. Uh, so they all inform each other. So the first eye of oppression is ideological. Ideological, what does that mean to folks? <clears throat> Politically driven. It could be politically or it could be religious. It, it, ideology just means like your worldview and like <coughs> your, your, your ideology is just how you think, you know, your perspective. Exactly. Pretty much. Yeah, it's a thought. It's an idea. It's this group is bad and this group is good. And that's where it really starts, right? Is we create a group that is bad and then we create a group that is good. Um, so some examples of ideology that, you know, we hear a lot, there's all of racism, right? Like some, some folks are lazy, white folks are not, some folks don't want to work, white folks do. Um, other things that I hear a lot regarding other identities, um, for example, I, I was listening to a thing on NPR who was talking about food that they eat. Um, and uh, oh, there's a woman, a white woman, married to a man who is Muslim from India. And they're talking about how she really changed her cooking um, when they were married and started cooking a lot more Indian food. And the call got all these hate calls coming in, say, or like negative calls. I consider them hate calls, saying, well, that guy needs to learn how to cook for himself. So much to the point that the show went back and had to talk to the guy and, and learn that actually, yes, he cooked. But people heard Muslim, people and assumed that he was, it was like that Sally Fields movie that came out like 20 years ago where <laughs> she had not <laughs> got my, my daughter. daughter. <laughs> yeah, like, I, I mean, it, it's our negative stereotypes. So we have a Muslim folks and a Muslim men and the assumptions we make about the relationships that they have with women. So ideal, ideology is, is sort of the starting point for a lot of oppression. Um, it's the idea that there's a good group an in-group and an out-group, and, and that the out-group deserves to be punished. They deserve bad things. So the next I is institutional. So institutional oppression is where ideas start to be enforced. So where it goes from being a thought bubble to actually being a practice. So what are some institutions that we deal with in our world that are parts of oppression. Schools. Police, prisons, schools, schools. <laughs> healthcare. Healthcare, absolutely. Federal cool. reserve system. Yes. Okay. Military. Yep. Yes. Pretty much everything. Entertainment. <laughs> yeah, entertainment. That's a good one. Entertainment, idea. media. Media, yeah. Yeah. Religion. Yep. Uh, religion is a big justifier, for example, of oppression against LGBTQ folks. Employment. Gentrification, absolutely. Urban planning and development. That's a huge vehicle of oppression. Employment. Employment, yes. 
economy in general. Capitalism. <laughs> yeah. Capitalism. So all of these are the places. <laughs> Everything. <laughs> um, yes. I would like to see the Constitution enforced by the government. Okay. Okay. Um, so what else? Other institutions? Yeah, you name it. Marriage is another one. Or voting. Yeah, voting is a big one. Yes, America. Yeah, religion. All right, so institutional farming. Yeah, systems. I mean, who gets to eat and who doesn't? Who gets thrown? Yeah. Yes, the entire judicial system. So all of these things, our ideas shape our institutions. Um, so I used to work in healthcare. I worked at Denver Health in the emergency department in an ICU. And no matter what people thought who worked there, no matter how progressive we might have been, we still, on a daily basis, or perpetuated oppression and the violence of oppression against our patients. Because the design of that hospital was based off of an idea of white supremacy, of sexism, of homophobia, of, of bias against poor folks and working class folks and homeless folks. So no matter what, you know, and we would try and tweak things here and there, but it was always just sort of rearranging the furniture of the Titanic. Like, it didn't change the direction of that ship. So, the entire structure being structured around white racism or white. So there's a jail in Denver Health that's in the hospital. There's a there's an actual there are actually several jails, but there is a jail unit in the hospital. In the basement. It's called wow. Yeah, there is a jail in the hospital. And the patients in the jail get treated fundamentally differently than anywhere else in the hospital. And even though I believe in prison abolition, I don't think anybody should be in jail. I tried to treat folks that I worked with that were incarcerated with as much dignity as I could. The fact was that it was enforced that they couldn't have certain things. They couldn't eat with a fork. <coughs> they couldn't eat with a plastic fork. And I had, and it was every day, it was a choice. Do I give this patient a fork who's asking for a fork, who's trying to eat a chicken fried steak with a spoon, and respect this human's dignity and give them the right tool to eat their food and risk my job? Or do I have to defer to the white supremacist heteropatriarchy that says that this person doesn't get a fork? And another example, we would have people in the intensive care unit who were intubated, so on a breathing tube, who were fully sedated, who had open surgical incisions, so their abdomen, they had an open abdomen. Their abdomen was open. It was just saran wrap shut. And, um, this person cannot get up and go anywhere. And they would still be handcuffed to the bed. Why? Where are they going to go? Or we would not be able to treat people without a prison guard in the room. And people would be going through intensely personal medical choices with a prison guard in the room. And those are examples of oppression that we could not change. I didn't believe in it. I knew what was wrong. Many other people did too, but we couldn't change it because, it, you know, you push too hard, you lose your job. That's what happened to me. Um, it was sort of inevitable. I lasted four years, which I felt like I needed like a badge or something. Um, but it, it's one of those things you can push and push and push, and you can try and bend the rules here and there, but when we're in these systems, we're still a part of these systems. An example of Oppression would be the opioid, or what is it, opioid okay. epidemic, and how white people are treated right now versus the crack epidemic, yeah. and how black people were thrown in jail. They yeah. weren't given the opportunity, yeah. not that I'm, I experienced that, but I knew people who were on crack. They were thrown in jail. It's just the same as people who suffer from mental illness. PTSD, there are no mental hospitals right now. And guess what? In the white community, it's different. 
I'm not a racist. I'm not calling anybody a racist. But when we talk about oppression, let's talk about real oppression. What you're talking about, forks in the hospital, I can eat. As long as I can eat, I'm good. But when you're talking about health and when you're talking about mass incarceration and throwing people in jail for the same crimes, giving them longer sentences than white people or any other race, that's oppression. That's an example. One example. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I mean, that's great. How can we trace more to treat? Narcan is the drug that you can reverse. An opioid overdose, but I always get the, I can't see that word. Sorry. Yeah, no, I, I get it. But that's what I, it's the O I O I sound. So police are being trained to resuscitate people who've had drug overdoses. But anyone who remembers the crack epidemic, there there was not a big drive to make sure that folks of color who are Bill overdosing Clinton is an example of oppression. Yeah. This laws, we still have black men and women in jail. For, since Bill Clinton, for nonviolent crimes, that's oppression. In a nutshell. So, from from this institutional oppression, we move into interpersonal oppression. So this is how we interact with one another. This is how oppression informs how we treat one another. Um, so one example that's a very big, it's very. Um, I would say an aggressive example is the fact that you know, there's a white supremacist march happening in Virginia right now that drove cars into a crowd of people. That is an act of white supremacist hatred. But then there's also things like, has anyone heard of the term microaggressions? Yep. Kind of like a wonky like academic term. Thoughts or just subtle, subtle things that you don't necessarily need to... Uh, you're not necessarily intending to be uh, racist or prejudiced towards somebody, but they you, you, you say or think from, and they're they're nonetheless they are prejudiced. Yeah, so I I learned to think of them as mosquito bites was how someone described them to me. <laughs> like it's those little things that it, it's the little slights, the little jabs that you get. It's a reminder of like you are not you are not up here. You are not living up to the, the, the goal of like white, male, wealthy, etc. So can folks give some examples of microaggressions? So I taught at a, at a kind of fancy liberal arts college on the East Coast. And one of my students is African American and she told me um, in the dorms, one of the things that what, it's very few students of color, I should say, are at this school. And so um, one of the things that would happen to her constantly in the dorms was white students would come up to her room and bang on her door and go, yo, sister, what's up? They would never say that to any other student in that dorm. And so in that interaction, when she's, as she's trying to get along in this environment, she's being marked out as black. She's being produced as black in that interaction. Yeah, and that's, I mean, that's like an aggression. That's <laughs> okay. but, but, but as, I mean, that's, that, that's an example, though, someone who, like, thinks that they're not doing harm. You know, they're, they're not trying to run a person of color down with their car like the Nazis in Virginia, but they're still doing harm that is racially motivated, that's informed by white supremacy, that enforces that. They think they're being friendly. Yeah, exactly. So here's a conversation that happens all the time. Andrea, where are you from? I'm from Denver. No, where are you really <laughs> from? Yeah. Oh, okay, well, I was born in Rochester, New York. Is that what you mean? No, where are you really from? <laughs> and that's why I want to whip out my army discharge papers and ask them if that's good enough. That's <laughs> so, huh. well, there's a video on that. Every month, at least. <laughs> Let's see, I saw a few hands up. I saw Jay and I see you, Veronique. So. Yeah, walking down the street and seeing somebody of a certain culture dressed a certain way and feeling threatened by them and, you know, increasing your speed or going on the other side. Yeah. Yeah, the like, oh, I'm going to just cross the street, the random middle of the street, there's oncoming traffic. <laughs> <laughs> Veronique. Basically, I, I think one of those microaggressions would be determining someone's rights depending on whether or not they had sex reassignment surgery. Yeah, absolutely. 
for you to have an ID that actually presents the correct gender, to get to have your medical records say the correct gender. Absolutely. Lynn. Um, um, I was racially profiled not too long ago in my field target. And when I um, approached the people that were following me, um, they were, I said I would, I would take pictures. I said, you, you take three security guards to follow an old lady around in the store. I paid for everything. <laughs> and you look at my receipt, that's fine. And then when I said, I would, I'll take pictures, I said, I'll take pictures of this. Three young guys following me out around in the store, first of all, and they followed me out of the store. Yeah. So I was still. Yeah, folks over the Northfield targets. So it's like neighbored by like Park Hill, Stapleton, Mount Bello. So it's like it. You see like the the yoga pants like. Well, yeah. But the Northfield target is like an intense culture clash because you can like I mean if you sit by the front door you can see like. Person of color walks in, security guard, like, and then there's like someone walking in with their teenage kid who's just like stuffing stuff in his bag, and nobody pays attention because he's got like a chrome messenger bag. Um, who else? What's definition of the micro? You know, I mean, a lot of people are giving examples. Yeah, I'd like to have actually technical definition. I mean, so I, again, I'm not the academic. I am the popular educator. The my facilitator, but I mean, it's really small acts that enforce oppression on a one on one basis. So, uh, another example is um, there's a lot in the non profit world. Um, a one of the executive directors has a presentation in front of a foundation. Foundation head says, You are so articulate. Yeah. Articulate is, is white code for. I'm surprised you're so smart and you're both of color. You see who you are. And even though you've power, you've gotten into this position, you've worked really hard, you're doing a powerful work, I'm just going to take you down a notch. I'm going to pull the rug out from under you a little bit. So and being more complicit stuff. is one act because many people are complicit and see things and they ignore it, they don't say things. That's the act of micro effort. I think, it's, I think it's another form of interpersonal. Uh, the term microaggression was specifically developed to describe those little slights that we do to one another in like a one-to-one -one interaction. Um, I think another one that I hear a lot about, uh, let's see, so where are you from? You speak really good English is another one that we say. As a way, again, just knock them down a little bit. Um, or I, I had a presentation and was talking about my class background, and people said, I never would have thought that you can't go for I just want to say, like, you're not supposed to talk like that. You're not supposed to be here. And we know it. And we have the ability to remove so, it. Just assuming that because somebody's name, first name is Muhammad, but they're Muslim, would that be that would be would that be an example of microaggression? Yeah. Or another one is, uh, oh, you're Muslim. Do you know my friend Muhammad? <laughs> Do you know my friend Ali? <laughs> Do you know my, like that that assumption that people of color are a monolith? <laughs> that they all live in the same place, that they all do the same thing. Um, so it's it's how we turn those generalizations that we have. And so often, though, I mean, some folks might be hearing these things and cringing because it's like, how many of us were taught that these are, that this is the good stuff to say, that this is us being multicultural or, or things like that, but because that's being informed by white people in a Disney writer's room and not by folks of color who are on the front lines fighting racism, we're actually just enforcing that racism further. Devil's advocate, I hear this a lot from people. You're too offended. You're too easily offended. And you people are sensitive. Oh God! <laughs> <laughs> that's another one of like of turning it. So, so your feelings, your feelings are the problem. It's not systemic oppression. It's not racism that's the problem. It's your feelings, snowflake. <laughs> so I have a friend who I'm trying to argue with who's that same way. He's uh, 
uh, yeah, he's uh, basically he was physically assaulted by some uh, black uh, men, and he seems to think that all black people are like lazy thugs. And this guy is a liberal, and he, but I'm trying. I've been trying to educate and say you need to look at your privilege. He doesn't seem to understand. He seems to think. That I'm by saying that what he's saying is racist and and it's not about his privilege that he is that I'm like just oh just sort of uh, putting aside the fact that he was assaulted that, yeah. and I'm trying it's it, yeah it's frustrating yeah absolutely <clears throat> yeah so um and I, I think that you know it's important to remember that some of these. Um, that's when, it, when it comes to interpersonal stuff, it's easy to be like, well, everybody meets rude people, or everybody encounters hard things. But there's a difference between someone being rude, or unkind, or even mean, and someone perpetuating this interpersonal oppression. There's a fundamental difference there. Um, because the, it, this all tracks Again, through this, these eyes of oppression. So um, there's a woman here locally named Nina Lone Tyler who has done amazing work to surface the hot, very high rate of black maternal death. Um, that there's a higher, there's an exponentially higher black infant and maternal mortality rate than parents and white babies, and there is no medical reason. There's not like a higher presence of certain medical conditions. There's, it is purely social and economic. And this has been shown from data after data after data. Yeah, and it starts, it starts with this idea of racism. It's enforced through healthcare, who has access to it, who gets culturally competent healthcare, who gets quality healthcare, who gets prenatal healthcare, whose jobs give them healthcare. It goes through money, it goes through environment. Poison water, poison food. houses, mm -hmm. food access, all these things. It's also the interpersonal things. So when you walk into your appointment with your OB and they say things, they ask you an appropriate <coughs> question, or they start talking about your hair or making implications on you based on your based on your skin color and no other information that they would never do to a white client. All of that compounds, and so it's easy to say you know, microaggressions, it's just a little thing, we all deal with rude people, but it's part of a system, and it's part of a system of violence, and it's so important to house it in that, that we are, we are talking about a system of violence, we are not just talking about people who are not minding their manners. Um, and then, so I'm going to finish my point, and then we'll see how we're doing time. So the final eye of oppression is internal, and it is how we take in all of these things. So if you are a person who walks through the world with a lot of privilege, then how you internalize that is oftentimes dismissing folks, saying, you know, it's not so bad. I've worked hard. Why don't you work harder? You want something? Work harder. Um, through, through thinking that everybody shares your experience, that's something that I hear a lot um, from folks that study class, economic class. Is it something that folks who are middle and owning class, upper class folks, assume that everyone has that experience, assume that everybody has that background and they don't realize that other people don't have that? But also, if you experience oppression, you experience the internalized version of all of that violence. You start taking it in. It shapes how you think about yourself. It shapes how you feel about yourself, your community. Um, it shapes how, what you feel like you can hope for what you can want. So I think one example that connects with my experience as a member of the queer community and as a non-binary person is um, my community has one of the highest suicide rates of any group. Um, very high suicide rates. Very high rates of self-harm. Teen self suicide rates of that too. Yeah, teen suicide rates. Very high rates of self-harm. Um, there's a lot of folks who have been told when you're when you're when you hear the idea that queer and trans people don't deserve to live, that they're always punchlines, that they're um, not as good as straight folks, when you always have to prove yourself through these institutions, when you get accused of being all kinds of horrible things, when you get denied 
identity affirming healthcare, all these different experiences, it's going to have an impact. And you're going to start to feel like maybe I just shouldn't be alive. And there's a lot of examples of how this panned out in different situations and in different communities. But it's just important to remember whether you're on the receiving end of that power and privilege or you're on the receiving end of the oppression and violence, that that comes inside too. And one of the most powerful things that I've had the opportunity to do over the past, especially two years, is thinking about what is white supremacy culture and how does that shape how I do things, how I build relationships with people, how I think about community, how I think about how things get done. What is um, like professional middle class culture? I've worked in a lot of nonprofits. And even though nonprofits have like the social justice message, it's like capitalism, light. <laughs> Uh, capitalism with a union contract. Um, and so a lot of the time how we learn to treat each other in those spaces is actually against the values that we have. And so I don't have a lot of time today to talk about it because we are running short on things. So, uh, full of things right now. Yeah, I want to make, sure, make sure we have some time to talk about movement and, and what this all means for movement, um, especially as we move into the next section. So I think you all are going to have some discussion, um, but I'll just say that I really encourage folks to think about um, and and look into like white supremacy culture, look into like culty patriarchy, and think about how these systems of, of oppression have shaped how we think about one another. Um, and one example that was really powerful for me to unpack a little bit was how I have been ingrained in it, so many of us have, to view people as you have to be perfect or you're disposable. So it's where, you know, if someone, um, I remember I was doing hiring for a position and, and someone applied for the position that had a very well-known history of addiction and had been homeless and had some really challenging interactions that a lot of people in the community knew about. And so people were like, oh, if we hire this person, what does it say about us? Even though this person had, had lived a fundamentally different life, it, it was 10 years later. Um, but because this person didn't fit the perfect image of what a professional looked like, of what an executive looked like, people didn't want to hire them, even though they were arguably the best qualified person. And so it's that idea that, we, that, that anyone is perfect, and then we enforce that and we throw people away if they're not. And I think that's just been one example for really diving into the ways that this culture has shaped how we do this work is important. Just a moment. Yeah, yeah, real quick. I just want to say that to me, being Ecuadorian, the World Bank is a terrorist organization. Uh, they're giving away $10 million a minute in subsidies to the energy companies, which is way more than we're giving to healthcare. And uh, the thing is that in Mexico, I was there during the evaluation. They've had universal health care since 2012. And I was there in 1976 when the peso went through the toilet. So, uh, I mean, it, it's, it's, uh, it's it, economic terrorism is what we're going through. That's really what it is. I want to get rid of these subsidies. The meat industry, a billion dollars a day, that's all. Okay. So... Uh, I, I definitely, I know that there's a lot of specific systems that we can talk about, we can unpack. The World Bank is definitely not a positive force in our world, but I also want to keep us looking at holding space for this bigger systems view. And that we can talk about many different things. We can talk about the prison industrial complex, and we can talk about the World Bank when we talk about systems of oppression and kind of keep this more zoomed out view. Yes. So Colorado tried a lot of people in Colorado, most of them white as far as I know, created the Amendment 69 to uh, create a universal health care system for the state of Colorado. Was it defeated by a white privilege, not wanting that? Well, it's the status quo. I mean, there's a lot of complicated things that go into why, that, why a health care bill doesn't pass. Um, I, and we can unpack that a lot, but I, I mean, there is definitely a mentality of, like, if people don't have health care, it's their own fault. Uh, I got mine, they can get theirs. So there's that, there's the, the capitalism, the classism, the, 
you know, I got mine, they can get their own. They can pull themselves up by the bootstraps. I definitely heard a strap Yeah, I definitely heard a lot of like racial narratives in there about like I don't want to pay for healthcare for undocumented people. I don't want to pay for healthcare for this group or that group or this group or that group. There's also a lot of critique that it didn't reach enough people. Uh, people who were directly impacted felt like that bill was not relevant to them. And uh, that ballot measure was not relevant to them. And that that counts for something. I mean I think that's why we keep seeing things that should be really good ideas, that we think are really good ideas, not succeeding. is because oftentimes the people who are shaping them, when you look at it, are ultimately not the ones who will be the most impacted. Did you think it was a good idea as a white person um, employed in that healthcare? I think we're getting a little bit Yeah, off. yeah. We're yeah. 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 drifting yeah. off to yeah. yeah. So let's talk about, yes. This, this, is, this is right in the flow. I'm just, I'm, I'm, I'm kind of question kind of. Yeah. Kind of goes back to the interpersonal microaggressions. Um, and I felt like we had an example here today. I, I'm sorry if we got on the spot, Michael, but I, it's happened to me before. <clears throat> you know, wanting to say the term people of color so we can embrace all people of color and condensing it to say color people, which has been used as a monitor oh, term for African Americans. Totally different. Yes, yes, I get it. But that's that's a, an example of a microaggression from what I'm, I'm an example. Like that his, his intent wasn't to uh, to penalize people, but his ingrained uh, you know, there's certain ingrained things that you just that it's it's like if you don't know not to say it, you don't you're gonna say it until someone's like, Hey man, that's a little that's a little aggro and then it's oh, okay, could could you teach me why? Teach me. And, and that learning moment. I've had that moment with friends before. They've given me that opportunity. So I'm curious at what point, I guess, a microaggression becomes a, an intentional microaggression. I get a lot with, with uh, gender fluid or trans people. You don't, know, you don't know how to address them at first. And I've encountered it, so I try to say they until I know a person. But I do got to admit that when a person looks like Bob, I'm going to say he. Like, it's just ingrained. I don't need it as a microaggression. So, so yes, yes, but it's very interpersonal in education. Something, if I hang out with a lot of people who are gender fluid and they just accept the fact that, you know, I, I skip and, and slip up nine tenths of the time, they don't consider it a microaggression for me anymore in my community. But I might get out of that community, the same thing plagues me, and now the interpersonal gets jagged because they might, it's not that they're being oversensitive, they're trying to draw my attention to it, but maybe. Maybe they have people in their life that never cared. So now, it's that now now they're, they they might not have the patience to explain it to me. So I'm wondering where this cusp is because the next step is internalization. So if we're interpersonally messing that up, and 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 people walk away from that internalizing something that oh these people are just sensitive, you know they got to buck it up because you know I had to fight for my health care. You know what I mean? There's a where, where does that microaggression become a microaggression, and where is it in that? where it's just two people missing themselves in the bay, you know what I mean? So I think that um, what you're bringing up is another form of a way that we can force this internalized oppression, and that's who's who has to do the labor of educating people. So um, I can tell you that I spend a lot of time, I, most of my friends are queer and trans. There's not a single person I've ever met who has said, I really don't care when people mess up my pronouns. Mostly it's, I don't have the energy to fight with people. I don't have the, the will. I'm just sick of, I'm sick of having to explain this over and over and over. Um, it's the same with like, you know, I, I just saw this happen in an exchange on Facebook where a white person said something that was really offensive and a person of color said that's that feels like a very racist remark to me. And the way they said it was actually like way more gentle than I thought this person was going to respond. And immediately the response is, why? Tell me why. Why is that racist? And so, and so again, it always puts the labor on people that experience the aggressions, that experience the oppression to say, they have to educate me. And this is something we're moving into this part of talking about what's the role. If you receive privilege, what's your role in this? And one of your roles is getting informed and figuring out you know, I, as a white person, no one ever pushed me to learn how to not be a racist white person <laughs> or not enforce white supremacy. It was actually quite the opposite. It was like, go this way, hate immigrants, go this way, 
become a police officer. Um, it, and so we have to, as folks experiencing privilege, spend time figuring out how to undo that and not just ask people who are oppressed to educate us. Because they have, what's that? And also to, because I, I wanted to say something earlier about the people of color. Mm -hmm. I'm not a person of color. I'm African American. Yes. Now, other people may consider them, when you put all of the same or different people in one group, to me that's kind of insensitive. I'm an African American because I was born here. I generate my mother, grandmother, great, 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 everybody can be traced back to this country. I can't go back to Africa. This is my homeland. So therefore, I'm African American. So when you call me, or I know you didn't call me that, but when you say a colored person, that is very insulting. And that shows that you are a, a person of privilege because you haven't educated yourself to get to know or get to subscribe or understand that there are other people in this country that don't look like you. And you've been here for a long time. A whole, a lot, a lot, a lot longer than me. I'm actually going to challenge the white folks in the room right now to not talk. Yeah. Because someone is telling us about the topic. Yeah. No, I, I'm saying just like, let's just ask the white folks right now that want to say something to not. I do have something really. No, no. <laughs> They want they want to be able to be exonerated by being able to argue. Well, so, yeah. yeah. So, and even if it's a labor, it's saying I don't think the why question is about one all the time. Maybe sometimes it is, but some of the times they just want to uh, uh, find it and a chink in the armor so that they can exonerate themselves. Yeah. All right. Sorry. So no. Also, a lack of intent does not mean a lack of impact. Exactly. Right. Just because you didn't intend to hurt someone doesn't mean you right. didn't hurt them. Exactly. Um, I think that that's something that's, that we bring up a lot. I do a lot of trainings for healthcare providers still. And one of the first things everybody says is, I didn't mean to do that. I don't mean to do that. It doesn't matter. It Like, that's... You know, if you get in a car accident just because you didn't mean to text and drive your in someone, then you didn't do it. Doesn't mean that person's car isn't smashed up and they are hurt and all that. Intent does not equal impact. But intent is still important. I would argue. We shouldn't take away intent. If I'm, if I'm intentionally bullying a person, I. Oops, sorry. I really didn't mean that. There's two different pieces there. I think it's important concept in law. I, but what we're talking about is something like the thing, the thing too is that the law is a tool of oppression. Right. And the yeah. law often takes it into, into mind where it would be intent. I'm just saying, intent is a factor that should be taken into account. Impact is the important piece, but intent needs to be considered. I will say that I will I will put in a challenge and say that I think that intent makes the person who's caused harm feel better. But to the person who's been impacted, it's often the, like it doesn't change the impact. Um, sometimes it does, and and I can't say all the time for everyone because I, I think that and, and I'm sorry I didn't do names and so I I can't call them people's names. But I think that you brought up this like everybody had. Not everybody has the same perspective. Not everybody likes certain terms. Not everyone likes certain words. And and even if I'm using certain terms that I've been told are the most appropriate, they might not be the most appropriate for someone else. And and so whether or not I intended to use the most appropriate language, I did. And that still that doesn't change how it impacts someone. And so I can say like I can process that out. But actually trying to say, like, I didn't mean to to someone who's been harmed, it doesn't do anything. Instead of saying, I'm sorry, I'll do better, and going and resourcing yourself is the best step you can take. Lynn. The one phrase that I cannot stand is get over it. Oh. Um, <laughs> yeah. 
All right. So I tell you that more time. Well, and again, it is going to kind of be intense. You know, I'm a long-time Toastmaster. I'll give feedback. Um, I have not been the best at providing feedback. Feedback is supposed to be based on presentation of the material, not the content. So we're, we're talking about people's nonverbal language, the way they speak, the words they choose to use. Um, I have, you know, I've stuck my foot in the mouth giving people feedback and said things with the best of intentions. Um, and it wasn't taken as a microaggression the way we're talking here, but saying things like, oh, yes, we're very well spoken in that speech. I've had, I've had Latin American people say, hey, I'm trying to work on my English, so please help me. So they give me the door. So what I'm saying is not in that point considered a microaggression. But when you're saying that the intent, I understand where you're coming from, and intent doesn't matter. And you did soften that by saying, hey, you could say, I'm sorry, I will do better. Mm -hmm. And I think that's where a lot of people don't take that extra step to say, hey, man, I didn't mean it, but I'm not necessarily sorry. So is that, is that kind of like a cusping action there for being involved? Like, as a white guy who, and in my family, you know, I got that lesson from my dad. My dad, I grew up in Cleveland. My parents were there during the, the riots in Cleveland back, back in the eighth or whatever. So my dad was, was kind of raised in a, in a relatively racist way. Like, my grandfather... So, you know, we'll say, oh, no, racist, but then you listen to him, you're like, oh, my God. Here. Yeah. And this is, I'm not ex <laughs> yeah, but, but I'm up. But so, I'm racist. So I, 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 you know, some of my family I don't even talk to because they're just too on that side. But there's a lot of family that don't get it, you know, and I have to have conversations with them. And you can't you can't take it back. I think that's one thing I'm getting from you saying. Once, you've, once someone's told you, hey, you stepped on my shit, you can't take that back. You, you can apologize. You can hope they'll take it back from you. And, and it, again, the burden isn't on the person. This is where you're talking about our privilege. Like, I try to take this message to people that don't get it and try to educate them on how to speak with people or how to be more open. Um, and I guess that's why I'm, I'm trying to make sure there is some way for people that are at the dunce, if they're going out in the world and they find out that their niece is binary fluid, which is or gender fluid, which is actually what happened in my family, uh, they don't, that they learn how to take that responsibility. So it's, it's, I guess my question is saying I'm sorry. Like my intent wasn't there, I apologize. It's on the it's on the other person when they will accept it. But you feel like that that kind of helped to heal the wound and maybe get people that opportunity to yeah man, you gotta go educate yourself. Like said your apology, go educate yourself on this stuff, read these people or whatever, get to know a different community. Like what is that the steps we're getting into with this next portion? I think so, because someone who acknowledges the fact of their ownership of their own privilege, like they say. I give you credit as my friend versus I wouldn't give anybody who's a Republican or Trump supporter who's in Virginia waving the Nazis play. So what you're doing, I think, is accurate because you're out there grasping, reaching, which is a true spirit of brotherhood instead of doing something else. So, so I think yeah. you're... I mean, I, I think that the thing... I think that the thing, um, one of the biggest things that I had to like figure out how to let go of and how to move with is like, I'm a white person raised in white supremacist culture. I'm going to mess up and I'm going to be hurtful and it's going to happen. And, and that's not to say like, that's not to forgive myself, but just to like, first of all, get used to being called out. And having people say like, you caused harm. And not going, but... Cause, but I'm the good white one, because we all want to be the good yeah. whatever. Yeah, um, we have to, we have to, to realize that the parts of me are complicit, and the parts of me are, are a part of this system, and that we can't make it better sometimes. And, and that the idea that like we can apologize things away minimizes the harm sometimes. Like, and so, so my response, I try sometimes and say I'm sorry, and other times I just stop talking and, and make it clear that I'm listening. I don't just like shut down, but sometimes people don't even want to hear your apology right. because, because it at that moment. Yeah, at that, that moment. And I think it depends on the relation. I can't say, like, if you mess up and someone's mad, say yes. But, um, but I, I think that I'm sorry. I will be better. It's a much better response than why. But I didn't mean it. Um, those kinds of things. So it's it's really interesting how how we're talking about this. Like I'm, this is like something just happened recently to me. Well, not to me, but a friend, a friend of mine who is a person of color. Um, 
Well, obviously, we had the bike race down in Colorado. I'm from Colorado Springs. We had the bike race down in Colorado Springs the other day, and he posted something about how he couldn't get home because of the stupid bike race. And one of my other friends, who was white, I'm sure she wasn't meaning to, but she posted this comment under his post, like something about, like, she's like, couldn't get home. Uh, at least you're not a poor person in Haiti having to ride, having to ride or, like, a bike or something like that. And I, I, I don't know, she's probably just trying to decide, but he took it as very racist. And now with the dealing with this, I mean, she hasn't, she, she obviously didn't realize that that was, came off as extremist and offensive to the guy who posted the comment and, uh, she, you know, so now we're trying to, you know, she, we're going to have to deal with that and, uh, you know, hopefully she'll come to realize and apologize for it, like, you know, it's... And that's an important point I think about, like, um, so I, I had a friend post something today um, because she's a disability justice activist and people keep using the word lame around her. So they'll say like that's so lame or that was a lame excuse. And and that's an that's an ableist word. That's a word that enforces that disabled lives are not as good as the lives of people. Um, and it seems a slur in the disability community. And someone and said I started out with thing of like, well it's not offensive when I use it like this. It's not offensive when I use it like that. And the thing is that it's not not, it's not up to people with privilege to decide what's harmful or not to a community we're not a part of. So if someone, if I say something and someone says, wow, that was really horrible and you need to check your privilege, I'm going to do, and again, I have a human response of being like, but, 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 but I have to try and say, shut your mouth, Zoe, and make eye contact and say, I'm sorry, I'll do better and unpack it. And it's not my job to decide whether or not it was hurtful. If someone who is impacted by that says that it's hurtful, then it is. And it, and, and it doesn't mean that also everyone's going to agree. There are people with disabilities that say, I don't care what language you use. Just don't park in my parking spot, make sure I have a chair at your event, and honor my ability requests. And I don't care what language you use. Um, the same way that you know, you'll meet women who say, I don't care if you can't call me. You'll meet people who have all different kinds of perspectives because oppressed people are not monoliths. We don't all have meetings and agree on like, <laughs> all right. So we also have to be able to hold that complication that some people, some people like the term people of color, some people like BIPOC, which is black indigenous people of color. Um, so there's all kinds of different terminology. Use whatever words the person is asking you to use. If they say it's offensive, then say you're sorry. And do the best you can to inform yourself, not off of their blood, sweat, and tears, but off your own. So Dr. Google is your friend. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, or Dr. Duck. Uh, or Dr. Duck. <laughs> yeah, whatever it is. I, uh, I, when I, I do some healthcare leaders, they, especially around the trans community, they say, well, someone used this word, and I don't know what it meant. <laughs> Dr. Google, don't make your patients do the work for you. You have a doctorate. <laughs> so you had a hand up. I did. Uh, this is a call out um, these sorts of, um, I guess, micro demonstrations of privilege within our own community. And I'd like to use the LGBTQIA plus community as an example, but there are definite parallels with racism and sexism as well. I came out in, in Texas seven months after Lawrence v. Texas was decided. And I came out very quickly and very publicly to everybody at my school, at my church, to my family. I have seen a marked change in, in and just you know how we identify terminology it seems to be so many more identities now than when there were when I came out. I also went through an education process, uh, you know, exploring with various older men in my 17th year, and it was beautiful. But they they were of an older generation, and they taught me the history um, of of what the culture was in San Antonio, and also you know, I'm, I'm in the United States at, at wide there wasn't always um, even a bisexual identity, much much less like a pansexual or sapiosexual or all these other things. And uh, something I've noticed 
is that sometimes it seems like there are cisgender heterosexual people who are ashamed of their privilege that they try to adopt one of these other identities. When is it appropriate for me to call this out? It's all in here. <laughs> <laughs> or, or am I just supposed to say, oh, okay, so you can redefine this term that in 19, or 1999, 2004, whatever, meant this, and now if you wanted to. You know what I mean? Like, and, and when are those discussions? I mean, I six minutes. Yeah. I mean, I think the first thing I'll say is that the place to have those conversations is in those communities. Um, and that I strongly recommend, especially like within queer communities, being at, like, remembering that young people and new perspectives and new ideas have a lot of benefit. And that, like, this is something that I think is applicable in organizing communities, in identity-specific communities, is some of the way. Like, I got to be the young radical for 10 years of my life, and it was great. And now it's time for me to make space for other folks to, like, redefine everything all over again. You know, the, like, the tail end work that opened up for asking for pronouns and stuff like that in my life. And that wasn't work that I did. That was work of, like, young folks probably, like, choose a side or whatever to. And had they not persisted, like, I, I don't know where I would be, honestly. And so I think it's important for us to challenge ourselves and not get territorial, like, I see, especially in the queer community. But I do want to, like, move us, because we have to play have, like, five minutes to land the plane. We're going to have to go throw that baby shower. Um, but I want to say, so we talked about the importance of just owning that we will mess up. Especially, and, and I want to speak to, to dominant identities, because I think that um, when it comes to oppressed identities, where it's, whether it's being queer and trans, whether it's um, folks of color, people with disabilities, um, whatever space you occupy, that it's important for those communities to define for themselves um, what's needed and, and where to move. But oftentimes, I feel like uh, folks that have dominant identities, whether it's class, whether it's being cisgender, whether it's being able-bodied or able, whether um, it's being white, whatever privileges we have, we're often left searching for like, what do we do? What do we do? Where do we go? And we feel nervous when people start talking about, you know, we're going to lift up and affirm the leadership of people of color. We're going to lift up and affirm the leadership of youth. We're, and we start to say, well, where do we fit in this? Anyone ever felt that? Like, where, where am I supposed to go? And and I, I think I heard some of that anxiety coming up when I walked in the room. I heard people saying, I've been here for a long time, and I don't want to have to leave. And I just want to say that, that centering the leadership of people who are most impacted does not mean anyone leaves. There's enough work for everyone to do. But it's about finding the work that you can best do with the tools you have. And so when I think about who should be undoing capitalism, who should be creating that vision for our economic system, I think that the people who understand capitalism the best have been the ones who've had to fight for their lives during it mm -hmm. and have had to fight the hardest. The same when I think about how are we going to undo white supremacy I think the people whose vision I want to honor are the people who've had to fight to survive under a white supremacist system. And so it's not my job to come up with our like anti-racist vision. But I can hear, so when I read, for example, um, the platform that was put out by the Movement for Black Lives, which is a really powerful policy agenda. I recommend everybody look up the Movement for Black Lives um, policy vision. I can read that and then I can think, what does this mean for, for me to take back to my community? How do I get white folks to fight for the Movement for Black Lives policy agenda? Um, how do I move the white folks that are in Inglewood who are one second away from voting for another Trump to instead say, I'm going to fight for guaranteed basic income and I'm going to fight for reparations, and I'm going to fight for demilitarizing the police and ending the prison industrial complex. 
So there's, there's enough work for everyone. It's just about finding where you use your tools. And again, remembering that the privilege that we have right now, we're taught to use our privilege against our comrades, against the communities that we need to be working with. And instead, we need to start pointing that privilege up. So if you have white skin and get access to white spaces, if you have access to safety around police, leverage it. If you have access to court systems, if you have access to higher education, whether it's because of class or because um, of educational access or any number of factors, use it. Use the things that you've been taught to use against our comrades and instead use it against the systems. And, and also be willing to trust the leadership of folks who have been on the front lines of these fights. And it's hard because it sometimes means we don't get to be on the bullhorn fist in the air person. And sometimes we still do. We st sometimes you still get to be. Sometimes it means taking a different role. Sometimes it means fundraising and setting up childcare and cooking meals instead of facilitating meetings and leading things. But those roles are important. And we have to all figure out which one is ours. Um, and so I, I can just tell that I've been around the Colorado Green Party for a long time. Um, I can tell that you're, you all are taking on big things, like you passed the anti-oppression, uh, what is it? I don't know the words. Bylaws amendment. Bylaws. <laughs> I, I fail at bureaucracy. <laughs> <laughs> I'm good at the like woo and dialogue, <laughs> feeling, <laughs> um, process. That was passed. Like the, the party is agreeing to take on capitalism. These are huge things. And so if you're gonna take all these risks on, let's make it work. Let's let's do it in a way that we can win. Because again, like I told you all about my kids, and I think we all have something like that. Our kids, our grandkids, our community members, the people we grew up around, that that you know, we do this for everyone and we do this for a sense of justice, but we also have those things that like keep the fire lit even when it's hard. Um and so also remember to do this, this hard work, the anti-oppression piece, for them. Um, I, I, I remember one of the things that really hit me, and we just passed the three-year anniversary of the murder of Mike Brown. Um, one of the questions that I've been asking myself every day since then is, how do I make sure that one of my kids doesn't become Darren Wilson? Because I know almost every person of color in my community has been asking, how do my kids not be Mike Brown? And I think that my question is, how do my kids not be Darren Wilson? Mm -hmm. Or any of those other officers? Mm -hmm. Or the guy that shot Philando Castile. Yeah, because that's <laughs> That one's out. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and you know, it, it's remembering that this work, even when we're challenging ourselves, even when we're challenging our own privilege, that it also disturbs us that it harms us, that it turns our kids into soldiers for the white supremacist capitalist heteropatriarchy, which is not our side. So um, with that, I'm going to go through the <laughs>